Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video from Genesis Apologetics. It's been a while since I've covered them, and this is one of their older videos, so it is in glorious 480p, which means that to stop it from looking all distorted and weird on our modern day super duper ultra high definition resolution screens, on which my 1080p videos probably look like garbage, hashtag where is 8K Rhino, I'm going to just keep it small and in the corner. Nobody puts baby in the corner. Let's go! Is it just me, or does the evolutionary story keep changing? No, it's not just you. It does keep changing. That's this really neat combination of the processes of learning and discovery that we know as science. Changing the explanation for something when we learn new things about how it works is, get this, a good thing. If our scientific understanding of things didn't change, then probably all three of my kids would have died during childbirth. Now, generally I've avoided using the quip about how creationists love to use modern technology that's the result of scientific advancement while denying science, because often the field of evolution is irrelevant to these other scientific fields, but for this general point, it is entirely relevant. All of our modern technology is the result of changing scientific explanations. If we stuck with Newton's laws of motion over Einstein's theories of relativity, GPS technology would not be possible. If we stuck with humorism for medicine, then we'd still be at risk of death from simple things like cuts due to our lack of understanding of things like bacterial infections. If we had stuck with Aristotle's explanation of light, photography would have never been possible. Scientific advancement is pretty much by definition a series of changing explanations for phenomena in order to be more precise and accurate. Hey. Hi John! Hey. Oh. Oh, hey. hey, where'd this truck come from? Up in the attic. I was cleaning it out earlier and I found it and it's got a whole bunch of junk in here, but some of it is actually helping me with our science homework. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't have a trunk in their attic stuffed with replica hominid fossils, am I right? Hey, hey, check this out! Oh, man! Oh, was this your grandpa's old yearbook? Yeah, it must have been. Look how out of date everyone looks. Was this really in style back then? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think our kids are going to look at our yearbooks and say the same things? Nah. Eh, I already look at my yearbooks and say the same things. So, how'd you say this trunk helped you? Well, I'm starting to get the picture on human evolution. <laughs> oh my god, trigger warning! I know this was filmed pre-COVID, but has blowing in someone's face with or without dust ever not been a super cringy and annoying thing to do? This book was published in 1925 by Sir Arthur Keith, and now he was the president of the Royal Anthropological Society of Great Britain. And the skull? It was found in 1912. Now it called Piltdown Man the find of the 20th century. Yay, Piltdown Man! Using a hoax that was exposed by scientific discovery is a great way to expose how science is always changing and therefore can't be trusted, right? Because if science stayed the same, then the advancing scientific progress we made in the 20th century would not have happened, and Piltdown Man would never have been dethroned. So obviously the scientists are all just a bunch of liars who publicly exposed their lies in order to prove something that the lie was already supposed to be proving? Yeah, no, this doesn't make any sense. I think it was the New York Times said that it proves the theory of evolution. And we all know that newspapers are the final arbiter of which theories are proven when. There were like 500 articles published when they first found this. Well, had it been legitimate, it would have been quite the significant find. At that point, the only fossils we had to represent human evolution were a couple Neanderthal skulls, a Homo erectus skull cap, and a Homo heidelbergensis jaw. Homo erectus was considered too different from the humans to be a human, and so was originally classified in a different genus, Pithecanthropus, and the Heidelbergensis likewise was somewhat dismissed for being too ape-like, a view that lasted longer than it would have were it not for the Piltdown Man hoax. 
Piltdown Man was exciting, because at the time it was the first find that was clearly a human, but was different enough from a human to be considered part of the lineage between humans and our common ancestor with the great apes. Being a hoax, it was deliberately designed to be what scientists were wanting to find, the kind of find that would get them excited. Is it really surprising that a fake would be faked in such a way as to be exciting? Then in 1953, they discovered that the skull was a fake. Yeah, and do you know how we discovered that? It's some of that changing science that made that discovery. You know that thing you can't trust because it always changes? Yeah, that. As we found more actual hominid fossils, Piltdown Man was more and more out of place, and in the 1950s, science had changed enough that fluorine dating was developed, and so scientists were able to date the different pieces of the skull and jaw, and found that the skull and jaw were different ages by at least a few hundred years. Analytical techniques had changed enough that they were able to detect the chemical stain used to make the bones appear old, and allowed us to see that the teeth had been filed down to look more human. So my question here is, at which point in history would you like to freeze science so that it no longer changes? Do you want to freeze it with us believing that Piltdown Man is the missing link, providing a huge issue for creationists by showing the clear missing link? Or would you prefer to freeze it as soon as it was discovered to be a hoax in 1953? Because then that leaves us with fewer hominid specimens than we would like, but it's a lot more than what we had when Piltdown Man was first discovered. All of these things were major changes in the scientific consensus. Should the old scientists have insisted on sticking to their guns in spite of the evidence that contradicted their beliefs? The fact that science changes to accommodate new data, rather than ignoring that data in an attempt to maximize consistency, is a strength, not a weakness. I'm glad that science changes all the time, because that means there's still more for us to learn, and learning is exciting and fun. Are you serious? Oh yeah. They took chemicals and they aged the skull. They made it look like it was really, really old. And then the jaw is actually from an orangutan. And the guy who discovered it, he actually filed the teeth down and made it look real. Which is all stuff that we never would have discovered if science refused to change when presented with new data. Like, really, you opened your video with a complaint about science changing, and then used the science that changed as evidence that science changes and so we can't trust science because it changes. Do you not see the problem here? What the heck were scientists thinking? Have you ever heard of Nebraska Man? Nebraska Man was the first American ape man fossil to be discovered. Nebraska Man is similar to Piltdown Man, except it was more of a case of being honestly mistaken than deliberately misleading. And it was never widely accepted in the scientific community. So in this case, it is a scientist looking at a fossil, thinking it might be from the human lineage, so he made casts of the fossil and sent them to other researchers who concluded that there wasn't enough data to draw any firm conclusions, before further discoveries at the same location led to the conclusion that the tooth likely belonged to one of the peccary species from that area. The only reason this one is a big enough deal that creationists like to bring it up is because an artist, coincidentally the same artist who did a lot of the Piltdown Man drawings, drew a representation of a species of hominid based entirely on that one tooth. This drawing was never published in a peer-reviewed publication. It was only published in one tabloid magazine in London, and that was the only place it ever had been published until creationists found it and decided to use it in an attempt to make science seem more speculative than it is, because look, scientists drew a whole species of ape based on nothing but a tooth that later turned out to be a pig tooth. And Harold Cook found just a tooth. <laughs> Bet that made for us some news on museum display. Yeah, well, it was big enough for the New York Times, okay? Yeah, there's the New York Times again. As far as papers go, it is one of the better ones, but a peer-reviewed scientific journal, it is not. And then it went viral for back then, and the London News did a whole drawing on it from a single tooth. I guess props for being semi-honest about the fact that the drawing was from a news organization rather than a scientific organization? But we're supposed to be talking about how science always changes here, not about how news organizations are frequently bad at reporting on science. If you want to complain about bad science news journalism, I will be right on board with that. It is a pain. But it's a pain that is completely irrelevant to whether or not evolution happens. And spoiler, no matter what the various news outlets may or may not have said, evolution does happen. 
There's still a picture of him on Wikipedia. Yes, of course there's a fucking picture of him on Wikipedia, you numpty. It's on the Nebraska Man article where it explains the find and the fact that it was wrong. Wikipedia is not presenting it as though it is part of the hominid evolutionary lineup. Wikipedia is presenting it as it is, a tooth that was misidentified as being a hominid and then later correctly identified as being from a pig-type creature. For fuck's sake, the first section in the Nebraska Man article is called Publication and Retraction. The only reason this one is significant is because of creationists digging it up, pun intended, and using it for this bullshit science changes too much argument. If it weren't for creationists, this whole thing would be a moderately interesting footnote in paleontological history, nothing more. They drew all that based on a tooth? Yeah, but ten years later they discovered out that that tooth was actually from an extinct pig. No way. Yeah, so... Piltdown Man was the popular proof for evolution for 40 years, and Nebraska Man was the popular proof for 10. Neither of them were ever the proof of evolution. Piltdown Man was once heralded as evidence that humans evolved, but it was not the proof of evolution as a whole, despite what the New York Times headline might have suggested. And Nebraska Man was never popular enough to have had such a lofty position. Also, you're making it sound like it was Piltdown Man first, but when we found out it was a hoax we needed to come up with something else, and so Nebraska Man conveniently was discovered at that point. That's just not the case. The Nebraska Man tooth was found in 1917, just five years after Piltdown Man, and it was found to belong to a pig in 1925, with suspicions that it wasn't quite as human as it was thought, going back to 1922, while Piltdown Man was still alive and well into the 1950s. Well, relatively alive and well. As I have pointed out in other videos, there were suspicions about the Piltdown Man find going back to 1915, so even when it was alive and well, it wasn't as alive and well as creationists want you to think. Makes you wonder about what they're teaching us today. Today, they are teaching us fewer wrong things than they were teaching in the 1920s. But there will inevitably be some wrong things that are being taught today, yes. Which is why it is important that science continue to change and grow with new discoveries, so that we can figure out which things are wrong and correct them. Now, if only we knew an omniscient being who wants the best for us, such a being would surely be able to correct all of our scientific misconceptions without us having to figure them all out for ourselves first, thereby giving us the actual correct science right from the start, would they not? Man, would that ever have been helpful. But no, all we got was this petty, jealous guy who literally forbade humans from eating from the tree of knowledge. I'm way ahead of you. Take a look at my little brother's sixth grade history book. Really? Your brother's book? You have way too much time on your hands. Mm. Well, some of these eight men look familiar. <laughs> Long lost relatives of yours? No, I'm just kidding. But no, it's because they're in our book as well. Oh, well, in our book, they say Australopithecus afarensis evolved 3.8 to 3 million years ago. But in the sixth grade book, Australopithecus evolving 4 to 5 million years ago. Uh-huh. Now, look at this. This is an old 1951 Life magazine publication. According to this, Australopithecus lived a million to 500,000 years ago. Yes, when you pick a bunch of different publications from a bunch of different time periods, you'll see a bunch of different information, especially in a field that has changed as much as the study of early hominids over the last 70 years. The current date range is from 3.9 to 2.9 million years ago, so if I were to hazard a guess, I'd say that the middle book that you mentioned is the most recent of the three publications, since it's the one that gives the closest to the most recent estimate. But yeah, there's nothing in science that demands that the last Afarensis died exactly 2.9 million years ago, and so if we find one that's 2.8 million years old, that will completely debunk the theory of evolution! No, it's that all the evidence that we have thus far points to that being the date range. If we find one outside of that range, then we extend the range to accommodate it rather than ignoring the find. Wow, that's different by a few million years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fossil dating in the 50s was not quite as accurate as it is today. This is not surprising. TV technology in the 50s wasn't quite as good as it is today. Medicine in the 50s wasn't quite as good as it is today. Are you upset that modern doctors don't recommend smoking as a treatment for sore throats and coughing? Would medicine be more trustworthy to you if doctors never changed their minds about recommending cigarettes? 
from every other area of our lives that has to do with science, pretty much everyone can universally agree that it gets better over time as mistakes are corrected and new data is gathered. But for some reason, when it comes to evolution, change is bad, and that means we can't trust it. So, what I'm wondering is if any of these dates are correct. It looks like today's truth is just tomorrow's fiction. Sometimes, yes, because when you learn a new thing, that can sometimes falsify an old thing. Things like date ranges for specific species change all the time because there is no rule that insists that a species must go extinct in a certain amount of time, and the date ranges are based on the dates for the fossil specimens that we've found. So if we find one that is outside of the range, the range changes because science. I'm not sure how updating our information to be more accurate in the future than it was in the past is supposed to be a bad thing that somehow debunks human evolution. If you look back at all the textbooks, they're all published at about the same time. All the textbooks? Or just the textbooks that you happen to be using? Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. There is necessarily some fuzziness on either side of these date ranges, so multiple ranges can be suggested that are both estimates based on the best data that we currently have available, and that's not a problem. Or at least it shouldn't be. It's not like these students' future careers as biologists or paleontologists or whatever will rise or fall based on whether they think a certain species went extinct 4 million years ago or 3.9 million years ago. Take a look at my little brother's sixth grade book. Now, this book shows all of the popular fossils today. Okay, so here we are, Homo sapiens, right? right? But check out what came before us. Homo erectus. Right, and while he had a human body, evolutionists like to point out that he had a different skull, at least a modern human skull. I mean, yeah, they had human bodies, but also human skulls, because they are a species of human. But if you mean you can just take one of their skulls and smash it on top of a modern human skeleton and it'll be the same as the other Homo erectus, you are completely wrong. They were shorter than us, they had significantly thicker and stronger bones than us, they had longer legs, and they had more slender arms than us. Now, the journal Science, back in October of 2013, they reported they found skulls in Georgia, like Russia. It shows how different the Homo erectus skulls can look. Wow, they are so different. Yes, there was a lot of variation in their skulls, but no more variation than the variation found in modern humans or chimpanzee skulls. The importance of this particular paper was in determining if the various species of the Homo genus that had been discovered in Africa were not actually different variations of Homo erectus. So this would cover the guys like Ergaster, which largely because of this discovery is now classified as a Homo erectus ergaster. But all of this is rather irrelevant when it comes down to it. As the paper that you're referencing pointed out themselves, this is not a problem of evolution, it's a problem of classification. Nobody is arguing that these guys didn't exist, but we're having difficulty in determining how exactly to classify everything because evolution doesn't put things into neat and tidy boxes like we tend to do. So regardless of whether ergaster is a subcategory of erectus or not, evolution still happens, even human evolution. Homo erectus in human skulls can be very similar. No, that's not what this is saying, like, at all. I mean, they are similar, but not in a these Homo erectus skulls are probably just normal variation among modern humans kind of way. Homo erectus is most definitely a different species from us. And just to make this explicit, I am not going to correct them every time they talk about one of these species in the Homo genus as though it were not a human. I've made that point already, so we can just all mentally correct them on the fly. In fact, they did a study on 202 modern-day Aborigines, like Australians, on the shape of their skulls, and they found that 14 of the 17 traits were the same on the Aborigines as on the Homo erectus skulls. This point needs some clarification. First, yes, Australian Aborigines do tend to have skulls that bear a superficial resemblance to some of the features of the Homo erectus skulls. This does not mean that Australian Aborigines are more primitive than other humans. This doesn't mean they aren't developed. These are differences that are purely superficial. But this paper was published back in 1972, and there are clear racial biases present in the paper that hopefully wouldn't be acceptable today, which have nothing to do with the data that they collected. 
but also this particular number that they share 14 of the 17 characteristics that define a homo erectus skull is not quite so cut and dry as it either has this feature or it does not. They did not find that 14 of the 17 traits were the same, as you have said here. For each trait, they gave it a score. If the trait was clearly present, it got a 3. If the trait were clearly absent, it got a 0. And if it was at all ambiguous, it got a 1. So that's a maximum score of 51. And when graded that way, the Homo erectus skulls that they looked at averaged a score of 49. The Australian Aborigines, who scored the highest for these particular character traits, had an average score of 7.7. .7. To quote the paper itself, it can be seen at once that the scores of Homo erectus are widely different from those of modern man. So it looks like Homo erectus wasn't becoming human, but was already human? No, it looks like there is a large potential for variation in human skulls, but Homo erectus are most definitely not the same species as modern humans. The differences between erectus skulls and modern human skulls are much larger than can be accounted for with normal variability. Really, this whole thing supports evolution. Given how much variation there can be between the skulls of humans of the same species, if a selection pressure were to arise that favored something like, say, a bigger brain, then normal skull variations provide enough wiggle room for the average skull size to increase over time to accommodate the bigger brain. And now here we modern humans are with our average cranial capacity of 14 to 1500 cc's. Homo erectus, for the record, had an average cranial capacity of about 950 cc's. Though, interestingly, if you look at when each skull specimen was found, there is a definite trend toward bigger brains over time. The older skulls usually had a range of between 6 to 800 cc's, while the younger ones were in excess of 1000 cc's. Exactly. The next ape man back is Homo habilis. Homo means human. So they're trying to make him look more human like than he really is. Oh, so now you understand that all the members of the Homo genus are human? Great. Acknowledge it when it suits you, gloss over it when it doesn't. So Richard Leakey is a famous evolutionist, and he said, of the several dozen specimens that have been said at one time or another to belong to Homo habilis, at least half of them don't. But there is no consensus as to which 50% should be excluded. No one anthropologist 50% is quite the same as another's. See my aforementioned comment about evolution not putting things into tidy boxes for us. Classifications like this are difficult precisely because evolution happens. Difficulties like this should not exist if God actually created everything in distinct and immutable kinds. So thank you, this quote supports evolution quite nicely. So they can't even really classify which fossils are supposed to go into which category. In fact, some scientists are fighting to have Homo habilis reclassified as Australopithecus. Yes, because it is incredibly difficult to decide whether Homo habilis had enough human-specific characteristics to place it in the human category. The difficulty is because evolution doesn't care about our love of classification, so the transition between non-human ape and human was smooth and gradual. At no point did any one individual non-human have a human baby. So the expectation is that the species that live close to the actual transition would be hard to classify. So really, whatever we decide to classify it as is completely irrelevant. What is relevant is that it is very obviously in the lineup of human evolution. Which one? Australopithecus is Lucy. No, stop, don't do this. Australopithecus is a category that contains many species, of which Australopithecus afarensis is one, of which Lucy is one single specimen. Oh yeah, I've heard of her. Yeah, now. Donald Johansson, 1973, discovered just the shin and the leg bone. The shin and leg bone discovery in 1973 was not Lucy. It was a different afarensis specimen. But yes, Johansson, the guy who discovered Lucy in 1974, discovered the knee joint of a clearly upright walking hominid in 1973, pretty close to where Lucy was discovered in 1974. Now, the way they line up makes scientists think that she could walk upright. That is not the only reason that we know she walked upright, but yes, bipedal species benefit from having their feet be more centered underneath them so that they don't have to wobble back and forth to walk without falling. Because of the width of the pelvis, this requires a knee joint that is at an angle rather than straight. The afarensis knee is at an angle that is not quite as pronounced as a human, but it's definitely not the straight line of the chimp knee. Mm -hmm. hey, there's a picture of her. 
Wow. There's a lot of her missing. Yeah, about 60% is missing. How is that relevant? She is not the only specimen that we have. There are literally hundreds of others. If you'd like a more complete skeleton, maybe look at the Littlefoot specimen. Well, I mean, Littlefoot is not an aphorensis, but it's the most complete Australopithecus skeleton that we have. And since you don't seem keen on recognizing that there are several different species of Australopithecus, you shouldn't really see a problem with me pointing to the Littlefoot specimen, right? But yeah, she's missing 60% of her bones. First, there is a lot that you can tell from 40% of a skeleton, and Lucy in particular was significant not just because she was 40% complete, but also because the specific bones that were present were mostly not duplicates. That is, Lucy is a symmetrical organism. If you have a bone from the left side of her body, you can reasonably extrapolate the shape of the same bone from the right side of the body. And Lucy's bones made it possible to extrapolate much more of the skeleton than any aphorensis specimen had up to that point. Which, to be clear, any aphorensis specimen up to that point is literally just the knee that was found the year before. We have a lot more of them now, but Lucy was the first proper skeleton. <laughs> hey, at least it's more than a tooth. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it is significantly more than a tooth. But really, I'm unclear what your goal even is here. Do you deny that the species Australopithecus aphorensis existed? Are you trying to deny that they walked upright? What is the end game of this line of argumentation? We know that they walked upright, not just because of the knee, but also because of the shoulder, the pelvis, and the footprints that we have from this species. All of these things indicate that they walked upright. So I really don't know why it would matter if this one particular specimen isn't 100% complete when it is complete enough to make this determination. You want to see the fragments of the skull that they found? Sure. All right, wait for it. Booyah. Wow. That's what they found. Not that much. And what is your point here? That the skull fragments weren't all that big? You do realize that highly trained experts can reconstruct skulls fairly accurately from small numbers of fragments like that, right? There is a lot of information contained in the curvature of those bone fragments if you know what you're looking for. And you also do know that Lucy isn't the only skull specimen, right? And again, what do you even hope to convince us of here? Even if we take away every single aphorensis skull that we have and pretend that we never found them, we still have the body of a clearly non-human ape that has features indicative of bipedal locomotion. The skull is great to have because it shows one of the steps in the evolution of the human skull, but it is by no means necessary here. Man, there's a lot of skulls in here. Was your grandpa a witch doctor? No, he was a yard sailor. Now, looky what we have here. We have here a modern bonobo monkey skull, and we have Lucy. So the brown pieces are the actual fragments of Lucy's skull that they found. And this picture of the AL444-2 specimen for the same species shows that they found a much more complete skull than Lucy's. But Lucy's was complete enough that her skull can be identified as belonging to the same species as this one. But I'm still not sure what the end goal even is here. You brought out a bonobo skull to hold beside it, presumably to show how similar it looks to Lucy's skull, but I don't think anyone would deny that there are some pretty good similarities there. But there are also some pretty big differences, most notably in the slope of the face. The aphorensis skull is almost flat-faced, while the bonobo has a prominent slant backward. Contrast that to humans, which have pretty flat faces compared to bonobos and the other apes, and it looks like aphorensis is kind of between the two. Almost like it's a transition or something. Her brain is only a third the size of a modern human's. About the average chimp brain size. So when they reconstruct the skull from those fragments, that's bad. We can't trust that because that's not a lot of fragments and they're kind of small. But when they say that her brain size was similar to that of a modern chimp, then suddenly we can trust the reconstruction to be accurate? If you're trying to say that Lucy's skull is similar to a chimp, therefore she's a chimp, then starting by casting shade on the reconstruction of the skull in the first place is a really good way to undercut your own argument. And she only stood about three and a half feet tall. Take a look at the way that Lucy has been portrayed in like the media, like books and films, online. Wow. Everywhere. They really went out of their way to make her look human-like. I mean, aside from things like eye or hair color, they went out of their way to give accurate representations as to her size, proportion, and posture. Being artistic renderings, there is some artistic license for some of the features which can't be determined through fossils, but the important ones can. 
I don't think they found any eyeball fossils, but if you wanted to make an ape man look more human, changing the colors of the eye whites in pictures is a good way to do it. That's true. Maybe? But it's not like we determined that Lucy is a good example of hominid evolution based on artistic renderings of her eye whites. Here's a picture of what she probably looked like. No. That's a picture that Answers in Genesis had done for their creation museum, specifically to make her look less like a potential transition between our common ancestor with chimps and modern humans, and to look more like a chimp. They admit right in the caption of the image that they allowed a biblical interpretation to warp their perspective on the matter. But when you remove creationist presuppositions from the equation, that is most definitely not what she looked like. Now, maybe you're right that her eye whites weren't white like modern humans, but were darker like modern chimps. But aside from that, the AIG representation is completely wrong. Man, what a difference. Yeah. Well, they do say they have found several complete skeletons of the Australopithecus. Which Australopithecus? There's a bunch of them. Be more specific. Though not specifically Lucy. I mean, earlier you heavily implied that all Australopithecines were Lucy, but, like, Lucy was an individual fossil find. So, obviously they didn't specifically find Lucy again. This isn't Star Trek, there wasn't a transporter malfunction that resulted in two of the same individual existing simultaneously, so of course we didn't find another Lucy. But we have found lots of Australopithecus afarensis, and even more of all the Australopithecine together. They found around 360, 362 actual specimens from the species Australopithecus, specifically Lucy. That sentence doesn't even make sense. I don't really know how to respond to that because I can't even really figure out what you're trying to say. Australopithecus is not a species. Lucy is not a species. Australopithecus afarensis is a species, and is the species that Lucy belonged to. You clearly know that Lucy is a representative of a species, and that her species is not the only Australopithecine, but you clearly don't know much more than that. So maybe do a bit of actual research before you try to debunk something? It's really hard to debunk a thing when you clearly don't understand that thing in the first place. However, Charles Oxnard said, The Australopithecines known over the last several decades are now irrevocably removed from a place in the evolution of human bipedalism. All this should make us wonder about the usual presentation of human evolution in introductory textbooks. Charles Oxnard held a counter-consensus opinion on the matter. My understanding is that he advocated against their being bipedal in the 1970s, but has since come to agree with the consensus that they were bipedal. He's still alive and professoring today, so I shot him an email. If he responds before I finish this video, this is where I'll tell you about it. If not, I'll update you guys in a later video when I do get a response. If I get a response. He's 88 years old and still a working professor. There is a pretty decent chance that he won't have the time or patience to deal with some rando asking him a question that he's probably been asked a million times already. Professor Oxnard was kind enough to respond to my email, and it appears that he does still hold a counter-consensus view on the matter. To avoid misrepresenting him, I'm just going to read his response in full. I had attempted to summarize his position in a way that he would agree with me, but I failed. I thought he was talking about the trait of bipedalism having evolved independently in multiple lines in convergent evolution, but that was not quite it. So here is his response. No, I don't agree with your description. You talk about independent lines of bipedal apes. All that we know is that the form of anatomical parts in new fossil parts imply that one kind or another of bipedality may have existed in some of these fossils. Note I say fossils, as indeed also exists in present-day apes, and no one would call them bipedal. This does not say whether or not the fossils were apes as we know them. We don't really know what they were. Bipedalism is not a trait, if by trait one means a genetic disposition. Bipedalism is a name given to what may actually be a number of different functions, with the implication that not only might they have existed in different lineages, but also in different ways. Further, we don't sufficiently realize that our estimates of how the various fossils are related depend solely upon what we know about the fossils we have. They are only a small fragment of the creatures that lived over time. If we model many times, and it has to be done many times to get statistical possibilities, the possible evolutionary relationships of a large number of forms, most of whom have never been found, then we realize that looking only at the ones that are found gives very misleading ideas, often wrong by a factor of ten. What is the percentage of found fossils from all species? Who knows, but it's a small number. 
For example, assessing from fossils, which is what the paleontologist does, gives times of splitting that are much later in time than are obtained when one includes the ones we don't know, i.e. have not been found. Of course, this can only arise from modeling, because we don't know, as a famous American once said, what we don't know. Of course, modeling cannot say what happened, but it can show what was unlikely to have happened. The possibilities that the fossils we have found lie on related lineages are much less than we usually assume. It's a very interesting puzzle, far more interesting than simply drawing lines between fossils. It's not a question of whether or not you fear misrepresenting my position, it's a matter of understanding that the whole thing is far more complex than the simplistic pictures usually presented. Well, now you understand why I've been digging through this chest. I mean, Really, the way it looks is that Lucy's just an extinct ape. Lucy is absolutely an extinct ape. Nobody disagrees with that. Australopithecus afarensis is an extinct species of bipedal ape. Given that humans are an extant species of bipedal ape, finding fossils of obviously not human bipedal apes gives us the information that we need to piece together our evolutionary history. I'm kind of feeling angry. Yeah, I can understand being angry at this guy's confident presentation of stuff that he clearly doesn't know anything about, but I doubt that's what you mean. Uh, same thing with Neanderthals. Check out these illustrations that came out after they started finding Neanderthal fossils. Check this one out. This was published in the Illustrated London News about a hundred years ago. For the record, that's the same newspaper that was the only place where the drawing of Nebraska Man was published. So they don't exactly have a stellar history of scientific accuracy in their illustrations. Whoa. Okay, that's pretty brutish. Now, do you want to know what they think he looks like now? Sure. Uh, how? Okay, for those of you listening in on the podcast, the one from the 1800s looked like a very hairy, almost gorilla-looking guy, but with mostly human posture. The modern one is a picture of essentially a human dude with the big nose and more prominent brow. We have, of course, collected a lot more data on Neanderthals since the 1800s. In fact, we've sequenced the Neanderthal genome, and we know which populations of modern humans interbred with Neanderthals. I think the point they're about to go for is that Neanderthal is just another human, and I agree, they were another human species. So close to us that we could breed with them, but also distinct from us. Just recently, scientists have discovered that Neanderthals buried their dead. They worked with tools, they wore makeup, they controlled fire, and they even found in a cave in Israel that Neanderthals and humans were living together and building families together. Yep, this separate distinct species of human had all the characteristics of humans, because they were humans. And in other places as well. Okay, well, okay, you know what? That settles it. That settles it. If they can live together, and if they have children together, then Neanderthals are just humans, but the difference is, is that their appearance varies, just like different people groups today can vary. Yes, but also the variations among Neanderthals are distinct from the variations among modern humans. And I bet they don't mention genetics. Spoiler, they don't. So either these fossils are completely human, or completely ape with nothing in between. Au contraire, you yourselves have presented multiple examples of species that fit in between and are hard to classify as one or the other. You just took that difficulty in classifying them as scientists don't know what they're talking about, instead of nature doesn't fit in our nice little boxes, so when something straddles the line, it can be hard to classify. Now, a specimen is basically any piece of bone, including teeth, that they find. All the specimens from all the different ape men that they've actually found, okay. you can fit them in the back of a small pickup truck. That is completely irrelevant. And again, you're undercutting your own argument here. How can you say that every one of the finds is definitively ape or definitively human unless they can actually reconstruct the skeletons fairly accurately? And if you agree that they have been reconstructed fairly accurately, what does it matter how big the bones are? And keep in mind, you can fit a lot of bones in the back of a pickup truck. Like, a lot. Uh, not that I know from personal experience or anything, but as you pointed out, the bone fragments are themselves rather small. Often the bones are broken and have to be reconstructed. A pile of fragmented bone will take up less physical space than a pile of unbroken bone, even if they are all the same bones. Now, if our textbooks won't address the new evidence, what does the Bible say? Man was created on the sixth day in God's image, 
out of dirt and God breathed life into him. And 1 Corinthians 15.39 says, All flesh is not the same kind of flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. Again, though, that undercuts your argument. You seem to be using that passage to say that man is separate from the rest of the animals and is therefore special and unique. But fish and birds are also animals. Does that mean that they are somehow special and unique, too? Is the kind divide really so high up the chain that it allows all fish to be the same kind and all birds to be the same kind and all other animals to be the same kind? If that's how general it is, then you may as well just accept evolution. That sums it up pretty nicely. Yep. So, what'd you think of Grandpa's chest? I thought it was amazing. Me too. And we learned that just like a style can go out of fashion, the popular ape men theories and their fossils do the same thing. And while their theory keeps changing, God's word never does. That sounds like a testable statement. God's word never changes. So if I can find one single instance of the Bible having been changed, which I assume they consider the Bible to be the word of God, I feel like that's a safe assumption, but one single instance of such a change, no matter how small, would completely falsify the position that God's word never changes, would it not? So let's look at the NIV translation of Matthew 13.32. In my Confirmation Bible, which is the 1984 translation of the NIV, it says, Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Now, if I look it up online, Bible Gateway gives you the 2011 translation of the NIV, which says, Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows it is the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds can come and perch in its branches. It seems that the 1984 version has an extra word in there. It says the smallest of all your seeds, but the 2011 version misses that word. The reason for this is that the Greek text has nothing in it to indicate that the word your should be there. That was placed there by translators in what appears to be an attempt to reconcile the fact that the mustard seed is not the smallest of all seeds with the idea that Jesus cannot be wrong. So we have at least three changes in this passage. The original Greek, which had no indication of a your there, the 1984 NIV, which has it, and then the 2011 NIV, which removed it again. The Bible has changed. Which version do I trust? Which one is the Word of God? Hell, I don't even really need to give examples, just the fact that there is a list of different translations that are all ostensibly the same translation but from different years should be enough to say that it does change. Why would they publish a translation in 1973, 1978, 1984, and 2011 if they were all identical? And this is just one translation. And of course I haven't even gotten to the fact that we know that later authors messed with the original biblical texts, things like the multiple different endings from Mark, or the insertion of the story of the woman caught in adultery in John. Just like, open your Bible. If it's one that has footnotes, pay attention to the footnotes, because they will tell you that some manuscripts say X, while still others omit that verse entirely. But yeah, tell me again how unchanging the Word of God is. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Phase Cat, who says, 30 seconds into the video and I have to wonder if you thought about making you bounce along to the audio. Keep them newfound skills fresh. I actually have considered making some sort of change to make my avatar more interesting to watch, but I'm not sure if just bouncing along with my speech would be good for that. But at the end of the day, stuff like that always seems to end up on the back burner because I prioritize the actual content and research for my videos much higher than improving my channel's aesthetics. So future improvements like that are not outside of the realm of possibility, but they are not high priority at the moment. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, What Jesus, and all the rest. Who are the fossil finds that don't give us enough detail to prove the evolution that is my channel? If you'd like to be detailed enough to prove that evolution didn't happen somehow while still not being detailed enough to be able to make a positive case for evolution, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wish lists, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form or listen to my podcast with my daughter, the links for those are also in the description as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!